Have you ever looked at your playlist and felt shocked at how much you've uploaded? That's what I'm feeling right now. It's been almost 8 months since I reviewed Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and in that span of time, with the inclusion of sequels and non-Disney films, we're nearly one movie away from being at the end of this era. I feel old. So old. Walt Disney's The Sword in the Stone was released in 1963 and was based off of the Legends of the King Arthur stories, though Disney gave credit to T.H. White. It was the last film Walt Disney produced since he died during the production for The Jungle Book. When thinking of this particular era, this movie is probably the last you remember off the top of your head, and I think the reason for this is because it's the only animated Disney movie from the 1950s and 60s that didn't get a platinum DVD, a sequel, a TV show, or a live-action remake. And in time, the marvelous movie had been forgotten. So before we get into the likes and dislikes, and then get into the dark era of Disney, let's go through the plot synopsis. The story begins in England, where we're introduced to Merlin Ambrose from Wizard 101, who is waiting for a guest. Merlin, voiced by Carl Swenson, meets Arthur, or Wart, who's voiced by Ricky Sorison, and Richard and Robert Reitherman. After giving a little introduction by revealing magic to a muggle, he explains that he wants to give him an education and moves into the castle Wart lives in, which is owned by child abuser Sir Ector, who's voiced by Sebastian Cabot, the same actor who voiced Bagheera. Meanwhile, news breaks out that a tournament will be held in London and the winner will become the King of England. Finding out that Wart has been offered to be, uh, this guy's possible squire, Merlin decides to use his magic to save Wart's future. His first lesson is about brains over bronze, and he nearly lets him get killed. The second lesson is about love, and since Disney missed the Twitter paid stuff so much, they made it a sequel. And since Wart didn't do his chores, Vernon Dursley bans him from going to London with them. But regardless of what happened, Dumbledore continues to teach Wart who can't even read or write, but his adopted father apparently can since he's able to read what was written in the sword. Talk about neglect. I can't read. Or spell. Fox, voiced by Junius Matthews, who also played Rabbit in Winnie the Pooh, teaches Wart to fly, and after getting chased by a hawk, he airplane crashes into Madame Mim's home, voiced by Martha Wentworth. But before she can murder him, Merlin Ambrose comes to the rescue and gives her COVID. Should have worn a mask, Mim. After Wart's replacement comes down sick too, Wart goes to England and forgets to bring Dudley's sword. Desperate, he pulls the sword in the stone, and England gets its new king as well as Merlin acknowledging the Disney company. The end. So let's talk about the movie. That is, if I can. Because good god, there is very little to talk about, and I'm not implying that it's boring, bad, or any shit like that. I mean that the sword in the stone has little to remember. The story is pretty straightforward and simple. There's a couple of characters, and the most someone is going to remember when they hadn't seen this movie in forever, like me, is the sword scene, which is what we were waiting for throughout the movie, the twitter-pated squirrel scene, and the battle with Man and Mim. I guess this pretty much answers why it hasn't made an impact to us in modern day. Because of how little it has, it's easily overshadowed by other 50s and 60s movies, like 101 Dalmatians, Sleeping Beauty, Peter Pan, those stuff. And even though it was the last movie Walt Disney produced, nearly everyone mistakes The Jungle Book being the last he produced, when in actuality, it was the last he oversaw. But what about me? Do I like The Sword in the Stone despite it being so forgettable? Yes, I do. A lot. And this is pretty embarrassing given how I laughed at my mom last month when she said she liked this movie. Big Uno reverse right here. The idiot now. But like all my reviews at this point, there's at least one negative that I have. And given how little this movie presented, it made it very easy to pinpoint what prevented this movie from being perfect. Shockingly, it was only two, which is Wart in general and a few story structure problems. Wart, in my eyes, has to be a very weak interpretation of King Arthur. Bravery-wise, he was able to briefly prevent the scary fish demon from eating him, and then that's it. He doesn't do anything to save himself from Madame Mim or the wolf, resulting in others having to save his skin. And in the end, he ditches all the stuff Merlin has taught him and accepts the position as Kay's squire, a minute and 15 seconds after he promised Merlin that he'll stick with the education. And to make it worse, he only pulled the iron sword from the obsidian because he was kissing Kay's ass. Better leave it alone. But Kay's got to have a sword. So everything that War has done in the movie only makes you concerned of what kind of king England is going to have. But I guess you could look at it like this. 
Fate saved his neck at the last moment, steering him back towards the direction of knowledge and wisdom, like what Merlin wanted. But if Fate itself had to make the character's big decision, that still doesn't make War a good role model. He doesn't make the final right or wrong decision in the end. That was only the production crew accidentally shifting the stage lights a bit, and then the entire country forcing War to accept the crown. He never had the thought of, maybe Dumbledore's right, maybe I am a somebody. But granted, Merlin probably taught him more regarding education after the movie ended, but it's not mentioned at all, so we're not entirely sure if Wart is going to strengthen into a better person. We're only going to assume that because of historic literature regarding the real King Arthur stories. I seriously can't believe that people bitch about Mowgli than Wart. Yes, Mowgli was stubborn. Yes, others had to save him. But he had the ability as a character to make his own choices to save himself and his friends. He pushed Ka's coils off the branch to save Bagheera, then did it again to save himself, instead of waiting for someone to rescue him. He made the decision to stand up against Shere Khan instead of running away. He used the distraction to his advantage by tying Tigger's tail around a flaming branch. That choice was brave, and it saved everyone because he actually did something without someone's advice. And the real icing on the cake is Mowgli's final choice. The big decision that Wart didn't have in the Sword and Stone. Wart didn't accept the responsibility as king on his own, whereas Mowgli accepted the importance of living in the Man Village, even if it meant leaving his friends and family behind. You see what I mean? For Wart's character to turn up as satisfying, he had to at least learn something in the end. Does he learn responsibility? No. Does he learn about the importance of knowledge and wisdom? Yeah, but he flushed that down the chamber pot so he could polish Kay's boots for a living. Could you imagine if we actually had a cool badass moment where Arthur puts the crown back on his head and accepts the position as king, ready to change the country through knowledge and not bronze? That alone would have made up for everything else. So, yeah, War as a character gets an F. But, but I can't read. Also, why the hell is War voiced by three actors? It's so distracting, and it makes it sound as if he's switching back and forth from puberty. Oh, yes. I'm trying to be a squire. I'm not even moving. You turned me into a fish? He was a monster. The biggest fish I ever saw. Sorry, sir. In fact, looking it up just now, that's exactly what happened. Sorison went through puberty during production, which forced Wolfgang to cast two of his sons. However, I have an idea on how they could have fixed this obvious error to make it less distracting. That is, depending if they were able to switch around Wart's lines. What they could have done was have time fly by during the movie, but instead of having a 6-7 to seven month gap from July to January, have it where it's roughly a year. Wart's 12 when the movie started, so with the one year gap added, that would have been more believable and more natural to have his voice deepen and crack more. That would have also put us under the impression that Wart was learning stuff through that time span, such as reading and writing, or learning that the earth is round. Another negative involves a bit of the story's beginning, which I spotted upon the second watch. I find it hard to believe that England was going through hell even though everyone seems to be doing just fine with each other. Because when they described at the beginning that it was dark times with no law and order, I immediately pictured the very few clips I saw of the Black Cauldron or the drought scene in The Lion King. But the only thing that was dark and evil looking was the forest, which turns into a real beauty to the eye about 30 minutes later. Is it dark times because of the wolves? Law or not, there's still going to be wolves around. Why couldn't the artists and story writers make it where everything looked a bit more darker? Show some thieves stealing shit during the tournament or something. And just like magic, my list of negatives is over, and I really didn't expect for my lecture on war to be so long. Merlin, look! I can't read! The first positive I'll mention is the movie's humor. This has to be the funniest movie from this era. The jokes and visual gags just come out naturally, while something like Alice in Wonderland or Peter Pan tries to force their jokes to work. And I think what makes The Sword in the Stone so funny is the actor's deliveries, which makes it ten times better. Merlin, the first Robin Williams genie, is the absolute best part of the movie. No competition. He's funny, intelligent, and extremely entertaining, including the fact that he references the future during medieval times. And Archimedes is wonderful too. I love it that Archimedes just isn't a cranky owl throughout the film and actually has a character arc where he grows fond of war and isn't always sarcastic or mean. Sir Ector and Kay are pretty good side antagonists and are a great representation of muscle and no wit, compared to Merle and Archimedes who are vice versa. 
Madame Mim is great too, but she's not exactly a villain worth remembering. She's more likable than Stromboli, the evil queen, Honest John and Gideon, yes, but intimidation wise, she kind of lacks that oomph compared to Corelle de Ville, Tremaine, and Maleficent. I guess in my eyes, Madame Mim leaves the same impact as Captain Hook and the Queen of Hearts for me. However, I'll give praise to that wizard duel scene. That's probably my favorite part. From the character designs to how the two use the animal's powers, and Madame Mim telling Merlin she said no pink dragons, not purple. What I really like is that even though the story isn't much, it's basically just an educational full-length movie, and this will seem bizarre given how I shit all over Wart's character, I actually find this concept kind of cool. It really doesn't excuse the negatives, mind you, but having a full hour and 19 minutes that teaches about the power of love or the importance of wisdom is very different and creative. And now all we have left are the songs. They are definitely better than the songs in 101 Dalmatians too, but as a group altogether, it's one of the least Disney soundtracks in this era to make an impact on me. I'll talk about that in another video, but as always, I'll be ranking the songs from worst to best. In fifth and last place is a most befuddling thing. It's no doubt the least rememberable song on this list, but it doesn't mean it's bad. It's a likable and charming song that fits the scene well. In fourth place, Hidgetus Fidgetus. I kind of have the same thoughts and opinions as I did with Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo. Even though it's mini language, probably more at that, it's a great tune overall. Best part is the opening. Hicketus, Ficketus, Sumba, Kazik. I want your attention, everything. In third place, Marvelous Madame Mim. It gives me Mary Poppin vibes and is very funny at times. Reason why it's low on the list is that it keeps coming to a stop here and there. In second place, that's what makes the world go round. It's a good schoolhouse rock song that has a pretty solid tune. In first place, The Legend of the Sword and the Stone. I absolutely love the medieval vibe it brings and it's a great opening to the film. Wish they did something like this more. So that was my Sword in the Stone review. After watching the video when I'm older and doing the research and investigating, I can see why this movie was great in its time but didn't make a comeback in the present, which is 1. Lack of advertising, 2. Living under other movies' shadows, and 3. Probably because it's outshined by... Which therefore, I deem to thee the Sword in the Stone as... No doubt about it. It's absolutely hilarious and a great educational film. I give the 1963 The Sword in the Stone movie an 8 out of 10. If you and your family haven't seen it before, then I highly suggest you give it a watch. And before I review both Jungle Book movies, I should really get going on this end of quarter stuff. Now that is foreshadowing. 